Remember the old stories of breaking down on a back road with a creature just outside the vehicle in the tree line, ready to eat your entire head that your parents would tell you about as a youngling when driving through the backwoods of Georgia? No? Just me then? All right. In a nondescript part of the United States, I'm going to say the South, where apparently on this road that nobody really talks about is lined with street lamps. You know what, I'm not gonna say the South anymore. All our roads are pitch black out here at night. Mother of the Year is taking her offspring to her father's house because, well, she's basically a turn the punch bowl. The, uh, the off spring is not the turn the punch bowl, the mother is. As they set off later in the day than expected because Mommy Dearest can't handle her drink, the car would be attacked by something unseen that would then shred the tire and crack the axle in half. That would prove to be quite a problem. Stalking around the car and hunting the surrounding area, it becomes immediately apparent that this thing does not appear to actually be a certified Earth classic. Or is it? As help comes in, well, this essentially becomes a signaling to it that it's an all-you-can-eat buffet. But what exactly is this creature and where did it come from? Let's discuss that in today's episode. But well, first, this episode is sponsored by nobody, but I would like to take time to shout out a program to help pre-adults learn to read. Known as Leap for Literacy, this program is designed and thrives on donations from people like us to give younglings books that they then could basically purchase through acts of kindness. We all know reading is massively important and can change the trajectory of your entire life. My man Stan over here, who I got to sit down with and have a Zoom call, he's a really cool dude, is essentially this upcoming generation's reading Rainbow Man with the plan. How it works is rather than kids going to a book fair who actually can like afford the books. All kids get to go to the book fair so that nobody has to sit back in class and just do work where they can purchase books by doing acts of kindness that they then can log and spend those points at the read and roll bus. On top of that, young writers whose ideas are selected for publishing get 100% of the proceeds from the books that they wrote, which then other smallish adults in their class can then go get. Now, why am I telling you this? Because I plan on donating $100 to the program after this video posts. And if you felt inclined to get books in the hands of younglings as well and feel like donating, you can help me support this worthy program and get it out there. Heading to leapforliteracy.org and scrolling to the top right, you will find the donation button where you can make any donation that you wish. Or maybe you could just post about this or share this. It doesn't really matter as long as you just get it out there. But if you would like more information on it, I will link that in the description below. Thank you for listening to this and let's get back to the video at hand. <laughs> We kick off our story with an understanding that there are monsters out there. We call them humans. And soon enough, AI bots that post so much on YouTube, they'll stomp out regular human creators because the algorithm is based on upload schedule and not actually quality of content. And I don't know about you guys, but there is no way I'm outclassing a freaking robot. <laughs> Anyways, a youngling talks about how her mother says there were no such thing as monsters, but she is wrong. About as wrong as the rest of her grasp on reality. Oh, by the way, uh, just so you know, it's one of those episodes I can't stand horrible parents. They're basically Giga Amy's to me. Roanoke not complaining of parental care? Impossible mode. More so in this movie, so strap in. We open up with a youngling listening to just some absolutely downer music. You can't hear it, but basically break out the razor blades. She gets some food, packs up her stuff, and we see there must have been a party last night as she cleans up and goes and wakes up her mom. As her mom does wake up, alarmingly I realize how old I'm getting because this woman that is cast as her mother, they look like they could be sisters. Welcome to the channel, Roanoke Aging. So she's where I think we have all been, waking up as your liver converts last night into acetaldehyde, which is actually similar to formaldehyde, which also triggers DNA damage and chromosomal abnormalities, rendering it a animal carcinogen, which doesn't bode well for me in my 80s. <laughs> oh man. Pushing that to the back of my mind, she asks where Roy is. His daughter isn't a fan and neither am I, which we will come to find out later. She tells the youngling to go load the car as she's getting up, but oh psych, it was a fake out. She actually falls asleep for another seven and a half hours. And you know why that is? Well, I'm gonna tell you because that's why you're here. Because expertly described by that one guy two videos ago, who apparently had to fast forward through my nutshot explanation in Dead Snow, it is who I am as a person. You should have been there for my senior seminar paper on toxoplasmosis. The brain's waves associated with sleeping run in very specific patterns with slight deviations in Homo sapiens, but still, it's all about the same. When you drink, you never actually enter a state of regenerative sleep. Trust me, this is important to explaining the mother's absolutely F-tier decision-making prowess later. In one is when you first fall asleep, which lasts about seven minutes or so. The body is not relaxed and brain activities still begin to slow though. This is when you essentially start hearing your dreams first, at least with me. Like, you know when you fall asleep and you can actually hear it, or you're starting to? This is what's happening. And this is also when you occasionally get a jump scare by your body, known as the hypnic jerk. This can cause your body to suddenly jolt, and it's been related to like stress, caffeine intake, as well as nicotine intake, but the brainstem essentially senses a fall in blood pressure and freaks out momentarily because it thinks you're about to figuratively eat dirt. The next stage is known as N2, and this is when you become more relaxed. Your body temp drops and your heartbeat continues to slow. The brain will continue to decrease in activity, but there are short bursts of activity that will actually 
prevent you from being awoken by external stimuli. This can last from anywhere about 10 to 25 minutes, and there is some evidence that shows it is slightly restorative without making you tired if you wake up during this stage. But N3 is if when you get woken up, you're screwed here. This is a deep sleep and it's much harder for someone to wake up. This is when a person is at their most relaxed. Around this point, the person has an identifiable wave pattern known as the delta waves. Specifically during this stage, the brain will enter a period known as REM or rapid eye movement. At this point, this is where vivid dreaming is most prevalent and indicates that the body is repairing and doing things such as you know, waste being removed from the brain. And this process is also known to become less effective as you age as waste builds up in the brain. There's actually been some discussion surrounding possible treatments concerning Alzheimer's plaque, which can be treated with ultrasound therapy, as for some reason it triggers the waste removal system of the brain to become more active. But if you forego this stage and are deprived of it long enough, the body will begin to struggle as systems fall out of sync. And this can lead to a flat line in those such as with a rare genetic degenerative brain disorder known as fatal familial insomnia. And it took me about eight times to say that. Anyways, essentially you can't sleep and within two weeks of you displaying symptoms, you will typically meet your end. This is also associated with a prion, however, and if it doesn't run in your family's genetics, you really don't need to worry about it. Now the thing about parting hard garth is the brain will struggle to enter deep sleep while alcohol is still present in the system. As the body works through, it will eventually be able to enter REM sleep, but this could take several hours. In mom of the year's case, the reason she slept for an additional seven and a half hours is because these cycles actually run in 90 minute increments. Sounds exactly like my stepmother when I was younger. It was a time and a half. So as a result, she went through five cycles of REM sleep which is about standard for what a normal person needs a night. Now her brain is wrecked by the sauce, so maybe she needs a little more time, but that won't matter when we get to the decorticate posturing later, because uh, you don't come back from decorticate posturing, usually. Ooh, foreshadowing. So they set out on a family fun time road trip now. The stuffed animal starts singing, which would be as annoying as all get out. Throw that out the window immediately. I mean, she's already a bad mother. Why not just solidify it? So they stop off at Rugged Ron's so that mom can smoke near a gas pump as the mom then hands Lizzie grandma's watch because she realizes, you know, I've been just a huge, just monumental piece of crap to my offspring. And because of that, she's definitely not going to come back after I drop her off at her dad's, which my main question is who awarded her custody in the first place. So then we get this horrible interaction of Kathy pulling a Karen about taking Lizzie to a play that she's in. Eventually that just devolves into her reeing at the youngling, screaming her to go F herself, which I'm sure won't be transferred over to the youngling in some form of trauma, and telling her to find her own ride. Like 900 IQ play there, bro. How did she get custody? Continuing to drive into the night, they once again have to stop because dear old mom needs to have a smoke break, but she's down to like three packs a day. Hilariously, despite Lizzie mentioning earlier that they should stop in a town that's only four hours away from her father's, they actually just kind of keep driving because Lizzie wants to nope out of the whole situation. Hell yeah, brother. But there's a storm brewing figuratively and literally. As they drive along this literal well-lit road, they are both wringing their hands in the same way because it's the passing down of trauma. Wonderful. Just remember, just because you go through something horrendous, you do in fact have an option to end it with you. Is it fair? Nope. Is it right? Yes. And by end it, I mean go get help. Don't, you know, literally. Anyways, the time is now 12.15 and mom is smoking in the car. No, Lord, she's back up to four packs a day. As they drive through what I can only imagine is a scenic route during the day, something slams into the car, sending them into a tailspin with the collision of the front with Kathy smacking her face into the steering wheel. Cosmic justice. Also, that wrist isn't doing so hot. Definitely tweak that. Also, the car turns off for reasons unknown and their tire is absolutely shredded, which I kind of found hilarious as someone who messes around with cars. If your car is running after a hit like that, it's unlikely that after everything has settled and the, you know, there's no more issues that you would just shut off. Plus it appears as though it was just a loose battery connection more than anything. And that would have immediately turned it off after the thing hit, not a few seconds later after they come to a stop. Anyhow, Lizzie calls 911 and tells her that they are on an old road. They're sending an ambulance and a tow truck, which typically 911 will stay on the line with you if there's an injury, as far as I know, more so if they're talking to a pre-adult. So mom keeps chain smoking in the car, five packs a day, as they look out and see the thing that they think they hit. Getting out, the car door is jammed, which that thing wasn't big enough to jam the car door is all I'm saying, and there's blood on the grill. The front driver's side tire is completely destroyed and Lizzie hears something in the woods near the wolf. Kathy tells Lizzie to call her old man, to basically come pick them up from where the ambulance is going to be taking them. We now get a flashback to one of life's greatest hits, eating ice cream on the floor. 
Kathy heads outside to kind of rifle through Trash Panda style and get some of the fire water as she drinks some of that sweet, sweet trash can jungle juice. It was around this point that Lizzie realizes her mom is incapable of kicking the habit on this, which pretty much seals the deal as it's time to head to Dad's. As they look at the wolf, they find a rather large tooth in its side. This conical shaped tooth clearly implies that it was being hunted by a predator of some sort in this area of the world. But it's unlikely to find a tooth belonging to a predator this large, unless it was like a black bear fang, which is always a possibility. They have fangs up to two and three fourth inches, or around 6.99 centimeters. Heading back to the car, Kathy mentions how some of the cuts on the wolf weren't from the crash. Hmm. Not really sure how you came to that conclusion. I mean, a car, more so with a shredded tire like this, could easily cut through muscle, bone, and viscera, but something is actually outside the car watching them menacingly, just standing there. As Lizzie wraps Kathy arm, the tow truck finally arrives where all their problems begin. Like the wolf's body disappearing, for instance. I'm sure that's not gonna be an issue later. As the tow truck driver gets out, he's already a little spooked as he shines his flashlight into the woods around him, which is fairly interesting because as far as we know, he shouldn't know anything is in these woods unless it's a well-known local cryptid, and if that's the case, why have they not hunted this thing to extinction yet? Like, no, really. It's a very human thing to do to secure the area. This is our planet, after all, at least for the time being. I don't care what any other species says. Uh, build society. Get good. Checking on the girls, he says to get their things and put it in his truck, as the ambulance is going to be a little while because there is a wreck on the highway. Tow truck man then grabs their stuff and heads over to the truck. Meanwhile, something is growling in the woods, watching these events transpire, trying to figure out if these things are made out of meat or not. He says to get in their truck, but Kathy for some reason wants to stay in the car. And look, I get it. Weird tow truck man arrives and tries to help you, and you're standoffish about it, it's a classic. But I think legally, tow truck drivers are not allowed to hook up your car if you're in there. It's like some sort of safety thing. So checking under the car, the thing did snap the axle. But you know what kind of force that would take? A lot. And this wasn't even intentional. It was just chasing the wolf through the woods and accidentally ran into the vehicle. So he's got to work on the car before they get going. Seems kind of dumb because it is, because now it's Roanoke car time. You could totally shift your car into neutral with a battery disconnected, even more so in an older car like that, which who knows, maybe you'll remember this in the future, as everyone does need to know this. Uh, if you're ever in a car and the accelerator gets stuck and you can't stop the vehicle, just shift it into neutral and hit the brakes. That's how you stop a runaway car. Like, I hear stories sometimes about people just getting absolutely ended by their car doing this. Always shift into neutral first. Anyways, you're going to remember this exact statement if it happens. You're like, oh yeah, that guy was right. But this lack of wanting to get the vehicle hooked up and out of there, especially because clearly Jesse is scared, is weird because quite literally the tow truck will lift the car off of the broken axle, so it really isn't that important. But my man just wanted to flex on Kathy and work on the car. Maybe he has a type. You know the one. The chain-smoking 40-year-old mom at the bar that when you were 18-year-old, I was 21 years old. Anyways, I'm required by law to say that was a joke, but Sammy T's in Huntsville, Alabama was a wild place back in 2010. Also, I'm pretty sure I was supposed to be 19 according to Alabama state law. So, Lizzie asks what, what the wolf could have been running from. Definitely not a cave troll from Skyrim, don't worry about it. As she looks at the tooth, she comes to the conclusion that wolves, in fact, do not have teeth like that. Again, their cousins may, which are the bears, and while bears have been known to hunt wolves, this doesn't really seem like an area that they would be kind of hanging out in or at least be this aggressive in. The time is now apparently just late as the tow truck man reconnects the battery and gets the car running. Kathy realizes her phone is in the tow truck and does the heroic thing, sends Lizzie to go get it from the truck in the middle of a storm. Again, absolutely trophy mother. Heading outside into the rain, Lizzie says that she needs to get her phone as Jesse tells her to get it from the truck. I mean, the dude is in the middle of fixing a car. Maybe he's just zip tying the axle back together. I have no idea what he's doing down there. But the truck is locked though. Nice, Jesse. Meanwhile, something is watching from the woods, and somehow that much rain hasn't washed away all like the blood yet from the wolf. Following the blood, Lizzie does a smart thing and enters the woods by herself. Couldn't be me. And as she does, she finds the wolf definitely didn't just get up and walk away. She calls out to her mom, but did you honestly think she was going to show up? As she yells out, something is behind her, and we get our first clue here, actually. So the thing is clearly predator and carnivorous, or at minimum an omnivore. And typically when predators are faced with a new type of prey, they don't know what it is, they sometimes will not attack first. It's sort of like why sharks do exploratory bites on humans first, and yeah. And it's also sort of like when bears like are skittish around humans, right? Because as I always maintain, humans are essentially cryptids in the animal world. We are persistent runners, and as we hunt something, the thing will lay down to take a break because it's tired, and we'll just show back up 
whenever the animal's tired. We walk on two legs all the time, not just part of the time. We have no hair really to speak of on our body except for the top of our heads, which is larger compared in relation to the rest of our body, and we make strange noises constantly. Plus, arguably due to our diets and what we choose to put into our meat suits, such as cigarette smoke and alcohol, we likely smell pretty bad. Oh, and like magic, we can also attack without even being close to an animal. Humans are weird, but animals are correct in fearing homo sapiens. At least any would-be aggressive animals. I want my cat, Mrs. Kitty, to still love me and not fear me. Anyhow, the thing behind Lizzie doesn't attack. Instead, electing to watch her for a moment, which given that she's actually hovering over its food, is highly strange behavior. This would indicate that this species is not adept at interacting with humans and might not know what she is. This will be important later, there's going to be a quiz on it. So we get another flashback to Lizzie hiding underneath a bed during a storm as she finds her mom passed out on the couch. Classic. She goes to get the knife. Ooh, and then uh, go and end this thing, and I'm sure that's not going to require years of extensive therapy to get past. Back in the present, Jesse continues to work as Lizzie gets back into the car. Lizzie tells Kathy something ate the wolf, which should be concerning the mother, as even if this was just a bear, that means it's somewhere close by, and you just, you know, let your offspring go out there, and you didn't really care, and you're also making a ton of noise. Meanwhile, Jesse starts hearing something growling as well. Like, when I was watching, it's like, dude, crawl further underneath the car. Kathy then says that the thing isn't going to come after people, and she bases this ideology on absolutely nothing. Very good. Kathy then pulls a Karen and yells at the guy fixing the car, but there's no response. They then realize, well, he's not there. And it's because he isn't actually there. Kathy then lays on the horn and finally decides to do something with her life and go check out what's happening. Heading outside? Well, Jesse's gone. As she looks around, she hears something and then hears some growling. See, after grabbing Jesse, the thing now realizes that people are in fact made out of food. As Lizzie looks out, oh my god, it's a blurry arm that hits the hood of the car, indicating that Jesse probably isn't doing so hot. And it's because of the rain that it's blurry, not the ridiculous amount of scrubbing clean of this site. Getting back into the car, they hug it out and try to remain quiet as Kathy realizes her presence is not really all that comforting to Lizzie, lol. Like literally, they're sitting there and she's like, well, I'm here. And Lizzie's like, I don't care. Exactly. That's why, you, you know, you don't treat your pre-adults like this. Kathy, if anything, your presence is making it worse. But there is a silver lining. If this thing takes out the mom, well, at least Lizzie still has the good parent left. Kathy tries to start the car, which, I mean, it has a broken axle, the windshield wipers running, and the lights on. Maybe turn off some of those power draws first, but I don't think it would really matter much. The snapped axle means you're not getting very far with that. And we will come to find out you have to be hauling in order to get away from this thing. Jesse returns after having his brachial artery severed, which is pretty impressive. You need to be careful with that artery, as a lot of people seem to think that you can recover from it, as it's only an arm artery. No, you have about 30 seconds to seal that up, or you're passing out from blood loss and succumbing within a few minutes. As she crawls back to the truck and unlocks it, well, you can tell he's uh, on the verge of passing out and having issues controlling his meat suit. They decide on whether or not to help Jesse, as we see his injuries, especially to his face, are pretty extensive. As they watch, they then see him get pulled underneath the car, and that's all she wrote for him. Ouchies. So now it's flashback time. Roy and Kathy are looking for their adult beverages, which it appears Lizzie got rid of. Roy ends up yelling at Lizzie, which if an alcoholic ever, ever attempted to intimidate my offspring in the future, I think I would go nuclear hellfire. I mean, I don't want to be this guy like, oh, I'm a keyboard warrior, but I think I would actually literally rip off a person's mandible and like break their arms and legs. I'm talking full on chimp mode who just discovered that you had birthday cake and you didn't share. Nothing near and dear gets to stay attached. If you know what I'm saying. I don't know, man. I'd be in jail. That's it. Uh, that type of stuff is bad enough on its own, but <laughs> I mean, we are primates after all. So uh, something about it gets me, but anyhow, Kathy does very little to help the situation and we see, well, she's about as useful as a knitted condom as then she smacks Lizzie because she's angry she can't party. And see, you guys may have thought I was being harsh, but my bashing this whole time was quite warranted. So as Kathy does the horrible job of being a parent and trying to calm Lizzie, she proceeds to say, oopsie doopsies, I was wrong. Monsters are real, oh woo. Yeah, no kidding, Kathy. But as they hide, that freaking bear's song starts to go off, and they don't know if the thing heard them or not at this point, but oh yeah, it heard them. It breaks through the window and pulls Kathy to a well-deserved end. Getting a look at this thing, we see it has no hair, its body is covered in a thick, dark skin, and its face is elongated into a snout with teeth several inches in length. The hands have claws, but we get just a glimpse before, unfortunately, Kathy is saved by an ambulance arriving. We will go more in depth into its morphology here in a few minutes, and we get a much better look. Getting to the ambulance, Kathy tells them to get off the road, but they aren't listening. So having done the whole EMT thing myself, I can tell you this, with a wound like that, the driver isn't just going to be casually walking outside the ambulance reporting to dispatch about how they need a coroner 
and animal control, they're going to be in the ambulance GTFOing because the scene is in fact not safe. The radio will work just as well driving away from that area as it will be with her standing there being a target to whatever is ripping people apart there. Plus, you have someone bleeding heavily inside the ambulance, there's just no way, at least with the guys that I worked with, that they would do this. The male paramedic then heads outside to find Williams to get her to come back to the ambulance as Kathy tells Lizzie to close the door as they hear the creature. Williams gets back in saying she can't find her partner and then asks what's out there. Well, there's her partner. He comes crashing into the windshield as for reasons unknown, Williams then kicks out the windshield. Dude, what? Why would you waste time kicking out the windshield? Well, it's around this point that something gets onto the roof of the ambulance and you can hear its nails scratching into the metal. William sits there frozen in fear as Kathy reaches out to her, but nope, it's monster time. It attacks her as Kathy goes to hit the creature a few times and then it turns around and literally screams bro at her. We see its massive eyes, essentially all pupil. Its face is unlike anything typically we would see on this planet. This thing literally looks to be like a frost troll minus the frost. It pulls up Williams to run away from the flashlight in its eyes as Kathy decides to finally do something with her life and then steals the ambulance, which kind of seems like something she would have done with her life anyways. As she drives off, however, this creature took the light shining in its eyes personally, or maybe the fact that she kept smacking it and didn't like that. It spears the ambulance, sending it crashing into the woods. Waking up later, bouncing around in a metal box isn't actually good for your insides, if you didn't know. Kathy is out, but Lizzie is able to wake her up, but uh... Well, Kathy's got some internal bleeding issues, as if her liver didn't have enough problems. She's concerned about Lizzie's injuries, which is a nice change of pace, as Kathy tries to get on the radio. At this point, they try to be as quiet as possible, but that thing knows they're in there. It jumps down into the ambulance as Kathy shines a flashlight into its eyes, scaring it away. But it's just beyond the darkness as Kathy heads outside to then throw up some blood, which is a bold move. I mean, you know that thing's out there. Why would you go out there? Just throw up in the ambulance. Realizing that this is a lot more blood than there should be, she comes up with an absolutely terrible plan. She says they need to make fire so Lizzie can get away, right? She makes a torch to distract the creature so that Lizzie can run away and definitely not squander the chance. I think once this thing was really just done eating Kathy, it would then just run down Lizzie considering the speed at which it could move. Kathy tells Lizzie that she's done either way because either the internal bleeding is going to get her, or the monster's gonna get her. So Kathy then heads out there with a torch and alcohol and proceeds to walk into the woods. She tells Lizzie to run and then puts out the torch. This part I don't really understand. Couldn't you have just kept the torch going and walked out of there with the youngling? This thing appears to be terrified or at least hurt by light and really, really hates fire. I mean, you cannot be that far from the truck up on the hill, maybe like 500 feet or so. It's gotta be the blood loss that made this plan come to fruition. The only thing I can think is maybe Kathy planned on like the residual alcohol in her body intoxicating the creature to the point that it couldn't chase Lizzie. I don't know. So she puts out the torch. She yells to Lizzie who doesn't run but instead comes straight for her as she is attacked by the creature. Well then, her sacrifice seems to have been a failure to launch sort of deal because she gets tossed around more than a preacher's daughter at a frat party. It bites half of her chest, shoulder, and neck, which, ooh, that's not getting fixed with Neosporin. It then goes in for a few more bites as Lizzie attacks it and blinds it with a flashlight. It bucks at her and actually does have almost a gorilla-like quality in terms of behavior. We get a really good look of its morphology here, so let's discuss that for a moment. Starting with the feet, we can't see anything, but it is customary to start there. In fact, it's difficult to see really much of anything on this creature. However, there are a few things that we can that will give us clues as to a possible origin of this thing. First, it is a highly muscular creature, almost in comparison to that of a silverback gorilla. What's interesting is, overall, it does have a very primate morphology, with the shorter upper arms and the longer forearms and fingers. It will engage in a form of locomotion known as knuckle walking, which gorillas are known to do as well. The skin is tautly pulled over the musculature and appears jet black. Due to it being predatory in nature and having this dark of skin, it's likely an ambush predator that uses darkness in order to hunt. This is supported by the fact that its eyes are absolutely massive, mostly pupil. Gleaning any light it can from the surrounding area, what's interesting is when the light flashes in its eyes, it lacks a tapetum lucidum, which again would hint at a more primate origin rather than any other form of animal. And the tapetum lucidum basically is when you shine a flashlight into a dog or cat's eyes, that reflection that you see is essentially reflecting light back through the retina so that it has a second chance to pick up any light. It's how they hunt at night. However, looking at the rest of the face, it is completely foreign in terms of primate presentation. While some apes do have a mandible and maxilla, their face stick out slightly, such as with chimps, this monster has more of a snout than anything. And in that snout, the mouth splits all the way back to with teeth haphazardly growing within the jaw. The creature has large fangs that flank either side of the mouth. 
Now the question becomes, is this thing of Earth or is it not? And given the clues on the body, I would be inclined to believe that it is a native, non-categorized species on this planet. Given that its appearance is very similar to species that we know of, this would help support the idea. Along with this, the teeth of the creature appear much like those on this planet, even more specifically, once again, like a gorilla. And aggressive posturing and charging of another species also seems to suggest that this animal behavior is of this world. Now, it's totally possible that other animals, if they do exist on other planets, may have, you know, similar posturing and charging and behaviors, but this one seems way too similar to what's already on Earth. Now, clearly, if it is an Earth species, the question next becomes, how did this thing form? Well, if you remember the tank video that I just did, the designation of cave-dwelling species, troglazines are those who like caves, but just visit them. Troglophiles are those who spend a lot of time in caves and are known to hunt outside the cave, and troglobites exist full time in a cave. Given this creature's physiology, I would likely classify it as a troglozine, given that it is clearly hunting outside the cave. And given that it is a cave-dwelling monster that eats flesh and is massive, it appears that we are dealing with quite literally a troll. This would help to explain its primate origins. Trolls are first and foremost legend, as we all know. People have claimed to have seen them all throughout human history, but they are essentially creatures with chimp-like faces, with black skin in some cases, but also with hair in others, so it just kinda just depends on what you're dealing with. They have wide chests, large heads, and enormous hands. They are said to be a different branch of Homo genus, coming from Homo habilis, making them distantly related to humans according to the theory of evolution. And this is why this creature would appear almost like a gorilla as previously mentioned, but gorillas split off from the branch with humans and chimps that we would come from like a long time ago, like nine million years ago. So this would mean that these traits, while similar to gorillas, are not inherited from gorillas, but instead, when they came from habilis, they essentially would reform in a different species. And this is really not that uncommon. Animals will form similar traits given the environment that they are in and what makes them successful without an actual connection being directly linked and more distantly linked. Sort of like how Neanderthal and Sapiens were incredibly similar, even though it appears as though there were hundreds of thousands of years of separation. And again, due to the theory of evolution, both of those would come from Homo erectus, not Neanderthal coming from Sapiens and not Sapiens coming from Neanderthal. But with this information, I believe specifically the monster has to be a cave troll. A primate who split off Habilis some time ago, but what's more interesting is why he's just coming out of the cave system now. So let's discuss that in a moment, because we got to wrap up the actual summary here at some point. It then runs off, taking some photons to the retina, giving Lizzie a chance to check on Mommy Dearest. Crawling over her mom, as promised, that is decorticate posturing. What is that I hear you asking? Well, I'm glad you asked, dear listener. Decorticate posturing is absolutely not a great time for your nervous system. When your hands come up like that near your neck, which is known as abnormal flexion in the arms and extension of the legs, it involves also flexion of the elbow, wrist, and fingers with adduction and internal rotation of the shoulder. This indicates a pretty severe amount of brain damage linked usually to a concussion of some sort. And you can also herniate your brainstem which means your brainstem comes out of your skull. This will do that as well. Now we know for the fact she probably has hit her head after being thrown around. It's likely this impact that caused her to recoil as such. Once this posture is adopted, only about 37% of people actually survive it. And even if they do, poor neurological outcomes are usually the standard. Now, one thing to note is something during these injuries, the brain will function normally for a few minutes, almost like it's rebounding. Kathy is able to whisper a few things to Lizzie about being sorry before she succumbs to her wounds within seconds. I think Lizzie at this point is about to be up to like a decade of therapy needed to get past all this. So as the monster continues to stalk around, Lizzie then leaves Kathy as she has an idea. Quietly crawling back into the ambulance, she keeps the creature away using the flashlight and then heads inside, and has also adopted the same nervous hand twitch as her mother. Well, that doesn't bode well. Grabbing some aerosol, probably spray alcohol, and the lighter, she opens up the cabinet and crawls inside before throwing her bear across the ambulance to serve as bait. The creature enters the ambulance, and we get a good look at our handsome man once more. I really appreciate how this movie actually shows the creature. It attacks a stuffed animal, reading the whole time as Lizzie gets up and nopes out of there. She runs out as it chases her, but then she squares up on it, which is interesting because if you square up on certain primates, you'll probably uh, get torn apart, but they will look at you for at least a second. As it jumps on her, she lights it on fire, which would have been perfect for Kathy to know this because she probably could have just smacked it with a torch. But interesting, after like just a few seconds, it runs around on fire. We can see it has wings on its arms. Hmm. 
but it quickly succumbs to its burns as apparently it has no stat points and fire resistance. With its body in full view, we can definitely see as described earlier, this is very clearly somehow a primate in origin. Its movement, posturing, and knuckle walking, it's very reminiscent of, again, the Auror primate. It confirms that this is a troll. Old stories and lore on the creature hold that they are extremely susceptible to fire, and with this creature barely being exposed to fire and succumbing, this weakness is quite visible. This would indicate to me, personally, that the skin has to be extremely thin, and what's underneath would have to be like a ton of nerve endings that when all that just ignites, basically it overwhelms the brain and they just experience like a psychogenic death. So with it burning also, I do have one issue. Again, we gotta go back to the wings. Now, I've looked at this. This could have just been a filming issue, but I swear, I do see wings. When I go back and look, it looks like in its standard form, like it's not there, and I can, again, only assume it's a fire suit. But hey, this is Roanoke from the future. I went back and watched it at like 25% speed. This thing most definitely has a set of wings that fold into the front arm, which doesn't change the designation of Cave Troll, but it does add another bit of complex morphology development. But this creature's back legs are much shorter than its arms, and as a result of it walking on its arms, its upper torso is massive once again, showing its origin to be a Cave Troll of some sort. And the reason its torso would also be this large is, considering that it does have wings, it would be using its torso more so to get around. But as we move back to those, uh, it is a bit of an anomaly, even more so than we initially thought. Having wings would indicate at some point it would have to come from a creature that had wings, or it developed it later in its environment after splitting off from Habilis. If this is the case, then why? Well, there's a few ways to look at this. Do I believe it's from Earth? I do. But I also believe, given its sensitivity to light and apparent primate origins, that it would be a troglozine, just unseen by humans, due to its cave-dwelling nature and propensity to only hunt at night. But the wings throw in an issue of how these might be adaptive traits. The only possibility is maybe that they're used as gliding wings instead of flying wings. You know, falling with style. This may indicate a massive cave system underneath the area with large, wide open caverns that lets the creature climb up and glide down in order to hunt in possibly an entire different ecosystem under the ground. Given the size of this creature, clearly it would need to be sustained by something below the ground that is equally large for it to feed on. Understand that this can help us literally rationalize why it would have wings. It may also be that it wasn't previously sighted in the area by anyone as A, it's not a well-traveled road. Two, it's not needed to come up and hunt before, meaning that something may have happened to its food source below the ground. And D, because it can only come out at night, this limits human interactions. Although given Jesse's cautious behavior, it would appear as though people do go missing on this road and the locals may regard it as a somewhat cursed area as anyone who gets grabbed by this thing is likely fully eaten and then excreted underground where nobody would find the bone remains. So as the creature lays there, it jump scares Lizzie as she goes cave woman status on it, seemingly ending it. I say seemingly because this thing literally speared a car in an ambulance, and given Newton's third law of physics, uh, energy needed to move a car that energetically would mean the same energy is being imparted into the body of the creature as well. If this were a human, it would be meat paste, so I doubt a pre-adult hitting it with a stick is really going to do much. Now we get another flashback to when Kathy was attempting to not be a total tool, but alas, she is in fact a total tool. She tells her, oh, don't be mad at me. Like, bro, I'm gonna go ahead and tell you, you're allowed to be mad at a failure of a parent. My parents were pretty cool. I've seen some failures of parents. Just be mad at them. Like, you're allowed to be. Like, you can forgive them and whatnot, but, you know, you don't have to be like, oh, well, everything's cool. I'm about to go on a tangent if I don't stop. So she goes on to tell her that she's going to be so much better than me. Yeah, no kidding, Kathy. Isn't an emotional manipulation to bypass awkward feelings just great? So uh, Lizzie then walks through the woods at this point, knowing monsters do in fact be real, when in reality, it seems like she was just like a first to contact a species that's unknown to mankind, which uh, we find species all the time when we look for them. It's really not that crazy. But all in all, just remember to bring your Roman candle and you too can take out a cave troll. Well, anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching my barely contained thin veil of contempt for bad parenting. If you enjoyed, then leaving a like is bro of you as it gets the video out there and other people watching because the algorithm is nonsense and I have no idea how it works anymore. Subscribing is also a great way to stay up to date on when I post. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, and Roanoke Tales channel link in the description. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you as always to Death's Dancer, our astrophysicist. Thanks, my man. I'd also like to thank our scientists, Chad W., Lacune, Logan Satome, and Tyson Nakanishi. Thank you as well, brohams. And to the rest of my patrons, I thank you guys as well. Your help goes a long way towards keeping everything running and is, as always, greatly appreciated. But all right, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.